True. What's with the coin? Heads is true, tails is false. Oh, great strategy. Hey, heads is true, tails is false. Great idea. Here. Thanks. You know what that's called? A really bad test strategy. You've probably already figured out that a student's life is full of tests, all different kinds of tests. So learning how to become a good test taker is not only something that will help you right now, but also something that you'll gain from far into the future. Whether you're taking true-false, multiple choice, matching, or fill-in-the-blank tests, there are many straightforward strategies that you can use to help. It's just that uh, flipping a coin, Nah. It isn't, isn't one of them. I almost had it. The following program is most likely about A. Bake Tam. B. Different types of test taking strategies. C. Dental health. D. Hovercrafts. I hope you answered B. Different types of test taking strategies? Because different tests require different strategies. I mean, you're not going to approach a multiple choice exam the same way you'd approach, say, a matching test, are you? Each type of test is unique and designed to measure something different. Matching exams test your ability to see the relationship between items. Multiple choice questions test your ability to recognize the correct answer among incorrect information. True-false questions and fill-in-the-blank test your ability to recall facts and relevant information. So, different types of tests require different types of strategies. However, there is one strategy that works for them all. Preparation! By preparing for your exams, going to class, completing your assignments, and spending time each day studying, you're gonna be using the most effective test-taking strategy there is. Preparation takes the guesswork out of test-taking. Not that there isn't, you know, value in the occasional educated guess, uh, but if you find that you're guessing on more than about 10% of the questions on most tests, it means that you haven't prepared enough. Okay, I'll have uh, turkey on rye. Yeah, mayo and lettuce. N no, no, wait, make that um, a roast beef on a Kaiser roll with uh, onion and uh, uh, how about horseradish on the side? Um, uh, can can you hang hang on? Uh, I'll call I'll call you back. <laughs> uh, choosing from a menu is kind of like a multiple choice exam. So many possibilities, but only one of them is just right. Make sure you finish my lunch order. How do you know, when you're taking this kind of test, exactly what the right choice is? Let's take a look at how multiple choice questions are structured so you know exactly what you're dealing with. A multiple choice question contains a question or an incomplete statement called a stem. The stem is then followed by four to five possible choices. Let's start out with a very simple stem. When crossing the street, it's always best to and the four possible choices. A, put on a blindfold. B, looking both ways first. C, run across as quickly as possible. D, wait for the light to turn green and then look both ways. Now, in a multiple choice question, only one of these answers is correct. The rest are called decoys or distractors because they try to throw you off track. <laughs> Start with this strategy. After you read the stem, cover the possible answers and try to predict the correct answer. Let the stem prompt a guess, not the choices. When crossing the street, it is always best to... Hmm. I predict the correct answer will be something like look left and right or stop and look both ways first. Now, uncover the possible choices and see if your prediction is there. If your guess or something very close to it is there, 
select it. But look at the others just to, you know, be sure you're correct. To check if your choice is correct, try to turn it into a true statement, like this. It is true that when crossing the street, it's always best to wait for the light to turn green and then look both ways. Obviously the right choice. But what if your prediction isn't one of the possible choices? Well, in order to get the right answer, you have to use the process of elimination. First thing to do is recognize and eliminate silly answers. Test makers deliberately put them in here to just throw you off. Don't be fooled. Don't let them get to you. Put on a blindfold? I don't think so. Yeah, this one's got to go. See ya. Bye-bye. Next, cross out any answers that you know are definitely wrong. Run across as quickly as possible? Nope. Great. Two down, two to go. If there was no other way to eliminate options, now would be a good time to make an uh, educated guess. There are only two choices left, so it means you have a 50-50 chance. If you spot a choice that has a problem with grammar, this may be a clue that the answer is incorrect. To test these choices, create a, a sentence out of the stem and option, like this. When crossing the street, it's always best to looking both ways first. Doesn't even sound right, so that means it probably isn't. Of course, you can't apply this rule blindly. Using test-taking strategies doesn't mean that it's okay to stop thinking. People who create tests are not perfect. So if the only choice that makes sense also happens to be grammatically incorrect, you should select it. And then there was one. We've eliminated one option because it was silly, another because it was wrong, totally didn't even make any sense, and a third because it was grammatically incorrect. What's left has to be correct. It has to be the one. D, wait for the light to turn green and then look both ways. But that was a really easy one. Let's try something a little tougher. An opening on the surface of the earth that emits lava is called a... Okay, good. We see that Jim has uh, covered the options and is about to make the prediction. And l l let's hear it. Let's hear the prediction. Vent. Uh, all right, now uncover the options and let's see if vent is there. A, earthquake. B, volcano. C, really big hole. And D, chasm. Oh, it isn't too bad, Jim. That's unfortunate. Okay, now what? Oh, all right, he's crossing out really big hole because he knows it's just silly. Off comes earthquake, because selecting it would be grammatically incorrect. You know a earthquake just isn't right. You remember the rule. If a noun begins with a vowel or a vowel sound, it goes with an article an, like an apple or an hour or an earthquake. Ah, looks like chasm is out of there. He obviously knows that lava doesn't flow from chasms, so that leaves volcano. And folks, the applause is off the Richter scale. Look at that, look, look, look how he tackled that. Oh, he's a pro. I'm here today to talk to students about the infamous option, all of the above, which often appears on multiple choice exams and which also causes much confusion. What does the phrase, all of the above, mean to you? It means your teacher's trying to trick you. All of the above? Uh, if I see that one on a test, I always pick it. All the above? I avoid it like the plague. Well, if all of the above appears on even number questions, I pick it. If it falls on odd number questions, I pick letter A. All right, so there are some issues with the all of the above option. But let's keep things in perspective. Process of elimination. This is a strategy that can help when you're confronted with this option. Let's say you're faced with this stem and these options. The presidents depicted on Mount Rushmore include A, Thomas Jefferson, B, George Washington, C, Theodore Roosevelt, D, Abraham Lincoln, E, all the above. Well, I know for sure that Thomas Jefferson and George Washington are up there, but I'm not so sure about the other two guys. Bingo! If on a multiple choice exam, you're positive that two of the options are correct, then select all of the above, because if you were to make any other choice, you would be wrong. On the other hand, if you know that one of your choices is wrong, then you can eliminate all of the above and the incorrect option. So, multiple choices and multiple strategies. By wisely eliminating options, you can actually increase your chance of making the right choice. True!
or false? The goal of the abolitionist movement was to end slavery. True. An autocrat is a person who really loves cars. False. The Battle of New Orleans was fought during World War I. True. No, no. False. No. I don't know. We all know what a true-false exam is, right? It's one of those tests which presents you with a statement like, Albany is the capital of New York, and you have to determine whether the statement is true or false. In this case, the statement is true, Albany is the capital of New York, but that's a really easy one. What do you do when you're confronted with a statement and you're just not sure if it's true or false? Have a look at this one. The Salem Witch Trials executed men and women for witchcraft in 1629. Sometimes teachers and other test makers will mingle truth with falsehoods. In this statement, it is most definitely true that the Salem Witch Trials executed men and women for witchcraft, but not in 1629. It actually happened in 1692, so this statement is false. And you can see how two numbers were transposed in this item to heighten the confusion. Yeah, they're good. You've got to pay attention to these details because sometimes a little thing can really trip you up. True-false statements sometimes use language that is misleading just to see if you can make sense out of what is really being said. Like this. It is not uncommon for a female praying mantis to devour her mate. This statement contains a double negative. A double negative is two negative words like no or never in the same sentence, which implies one thing, but really means the opposite. If something is not uncommon, it really means it's common. Therefore, in this case, the statement is true. Beware of statements that give reasons. Simply because a justification is given does not necessarily make the statement true. Sometimes test makers give reasons because they sound authoritative. Again. Your knowledge and understanding of the material is being tested. Have a look at this one. People only love pizza because it's a fast, convenient food. Now, it's true that people love pizza. I mean, there wouldn't be as many pizzerias or advertisements for pizza if it weren't true. But saying that the only reason people love it is because it's a fast, convenient food is not true. I mean, the statement says that people only like pizza because it's convenient. Well, some people, believe it or not, may like pizza just because it tastes good. And in some places, delicious pepperoni pizza may be very hard to come by. Therefore, this statement is false. True-false tests can be a little tricky, but by paying careful attention to how the statements are worded, you'll soon be able to uncover the truth. On both multiple choice and true-false tests, there are some words you can trust and some words that just can't be trusted. Generally be suspicious of words such as all, always, only, invariably, None, never, nobody, no one, best, worst, everybody, everyone, absolutely, absolutely not, certainly, and certainly not. Absolutes usually make statements, stems, or options false. This is because they allow no room for exceptions. And in life, there are very few things in which there are no exceptions. You can trust qualifiers, such as usually, some, probably, might, frequently, seldom, a majority, a few, often, many, apt to, may, sometimes, much, most, likely, and unlikely. Qualifiers tend to make statements, stems, and options true. Let me show you what I mean. It never snows in Florida. Oh, really? That word never is an absolute. So for the statement to be true, it would mean that it has never, ever snowed in Florida. Not even once. And guess what? It has. Now, watch what happens when you replace an absolute with a qualifier. It rarely snows in Florida. Because the word rarely allows for the possibility that it may have snowed in Florida, this statement is true. As I said, there are exceptions to most things in life. <laughs> Romeo and Juliet. Peanut butter and jelly. Anthony and Cleopatra, ham and cheese. What, do you ask? Does this illustrious list of people and sandwiches have to do with exams? Certain things are just meant to go together. They're perfectly matched. 
A matching test is a test where there are two lists of things that require you to match an item from one list with an item from the other. And there's a special strategy for this kind of test. This test requires that the test taker match the president to the war that began during his presidency. First, read through both lists. Then, use one list as a starting point. It doesn't matter which one, whatever works for you. Let's start on this side, the list of the presidents. Begin with the first item, which in this case is Lyndon B. Johnson. Remember, we are looking for the war that began during Lyndon B. Johnson's presidency. Now, let's go through the other list to see if we can't identify the war. Grenada Invasion, 1980s. No. World War II, 1940s. No. World War I, 1914. Spanish-American War, 1890s. Can't be that. Now let's keep going until we find what we think may be the right answer. Oh, wait a minute. All right, I think this is it. The Vietnam War. Even though I'm pretty sure this is the perfect match, I'll finish reading the list in case there's an even better match. And there isn't. So the Vietnam War it is. Make your selection, then cross off both items that have been matched. This will keep you organized. Go through the list, making all of the matches you know for sure, then go back to the ones you don't know. And remember that you are looking for the best possible match. The following blank will discuss strategies for answering questions on blank blank. What? Confused? It's just my way of telling you that we're now talking about fill-in-the-blank tests. The kind of tests you're given with questions, words, or phrases missing, and you have to select grammatically correct answers. You can choose your answer either from a list or from memory. Start by reading through the entire question and any choices that may be provided. But let's have a look at something a bit more serious. And blank occurs when the immune system becomes overly sensitive to something in the environment. A, tumor. B, aneurysm. C, allergy. D, amoeba. Next, you want to look for clues to the answer in the information that is provided with the question. So the key words here are immune system and sensitivity. We are looking for something that connects them. Well, I know that aneurysm is usually associated with the blood vessels, so I will eliminate that one right away. And amoeba is a type of organism, so that one goes. And remember, any option you select must be grammatically correct. Let's see. And tumor occurs. No, that doesn't work. So that can go too. So that only leaves one choice. C, allergy. After you've made your selection, reread the entire sentence. Make sure it makes sense. An allergy occurs when the immune system becomes overly sensitive to something in the environment. Perfect. Looking for clues to the answer in the statement and eliminating grammatically incorrect options will certainly help you make the perfect match. Whether you're taking a multiple choice, true-false, matching, or fill-in-the-blank test, there are certain things you can do before and during the test that will increase your chances of success. Find out from your teacher what kind of test you'll be having and how the test will be graded. Should you try to answer all of the questions, even if you have to guess, will there be a <clears throat> penalty for wrong answers? And if there is no penalty for wrong answers, you should always guess. You might get lucky. However, if there is a penalty for wrong answers, only take an educated guess if you can eliminate some of the wrong choices. Knowing these things in advance means you can develop your strategy before the test and not have to decide what to do when the test is right in front of you. Try to find out how many questions will be on the test and how long you'll have to complete the test. This way you'll be able to plan out how much time you'll have to answer each question. If possible, always leave a few minutes to check your work. Make sure you write neatly. Don't make any stray marks or doodles or tiny bubble thingies. Oh, and the tiny bubbles? Make sure you fill those in completely. Answer all of the questions you know first, and then, if possible, mark the ones you don't know and go back to them later. If you do a race, do so completely. Hey!
and make sure that the answer you select corresponds to the question that you're answering. Whoa. Whether you're taking a multiple choice, true, false, fill in the blank, or matching test, remember, the most effective test taking strategy of them all is to be adequately prepared. Nothing can take the place of just knowing the material. But when you do find yourself in that tight spot, and we all have, instead of just guessing blindly or leaving questions unanswered, try using some of these strategies. So doing well on tests won't be a toss up. <laughs>